for it makes things a lot easier if you mute yourself, especially during the presentation. There's not a lot of background noise. Um, if not, you're not comfortable with that, then just raise your hand and ask a question. So, okay. So I want to welcome everyone to the general meeting Friday, March the 26th, 2021. I have some announcements to make. Um, first off, uh, these are good news stories. Everybody wants to hear a good news story. This month, we have the pleasure of making two announcements. Firstly, March 15th marked the official book release of Flight from Grace, A C Cultural History of Humans and Birds by Richard Pope and published by McGill Queens University Press. It's a beautiful hardcover book and can be purchased from Let's Talk Books in Coburg and Furby House Bookstores in uh, <laughs> Port Hope. And I hear they're flying off the shelf. Um, number oh. two. Oh, uh, it's Jesus. pretty bad, isn't it? Uh, number, <laughs> it is. <laughs> number two, the second good uh, news item is the 2020 Conservation Award presented to Elizabeth Kellogg last Saturday at the Ontario Eastern Bluebird Society Annual General Meeting. Elizabeth adds that this is the same award given to Hazelbird in 1997. Elizabeth is well known for nature advocacy over many years and has been intimately involved with publishing the Curlew newsletter for 25 years. Congratulations to both Richard and Elizabeth, our longtime, well-respected members of Willow Beach Field Naturalists. So, here, here. Thank you. Yes. Thanks, Frank. Thank you. Next, um, in announcements, I want to get through this. Uh, there's an order of business that we have to deal with tonight, and uh, a motion is uh, put forward uh, that the appointment of Grant Elliott as interim second vice president uh, be ratified uh, at the general at this general meeting of members. Our constitution allows the executive to appoint an interim uh, uh, to fill a vacancy and uh, then have it approved at the first uh, general meeting of members uh, on an interim basis. So uh, I need a motion for that. I will make the motion. Okay, I do we have a will, second? I will second it, Ken Bagshaw. Thank you, Ken. Um, all in favor? Aye. 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 It's Aye. Okay, so Carried. the easiest thing. Carried. <laughs> no, <laughs> I can ask if anybody is opposed Wait. and hearing none, um, I will say that the motion is carried. So thank you very much for that. Um, so that takes us through the first section of the meeting. Um, at this time, Elizabeth Kellogg will lead the popular bird sightings and outing section of the meeting. Elizabeth, over to you. Elizabeth? I know she's here somewhere. Sorry. She's muted herself. <clears throat> Actually, her, um, Elizabeth and Rogers microphone doesn't seem to be right, connecting. The connection has been proved to be unstable. Oh, here we are. I'm here. Yeah, Lord. I'm here now, but I disconnected. It's not, it was really. No, he's not coming in very clearly. What seems to be the problem, Jamie? I don't know. Her connection just doesn't seem to be super good. Because uh, we're only hearing about half of what you're saying. Um, I can see you. Maybe just keep trying, Elizabeth, keep trying talking so we can uh, see if it will work. But. Uh, well, uh, she looks shell shocked. I think she's frozen. <laughs> It's because it's frozen. The rest of us aren't frozen. Yeah, okay. Um, maybe we need someone else to run the... Because unfortunately, Elizabeth's connection, we're only hearing about half of what you're saying. Jamie? Uh, yes? Jamie? Yep. Can I put you on the spot? Yeah, I did this. Sure. And if a, go ahead. Anyway, Jamie, what I was going to say, if Elizabeth can't do it, can you do bird sightings? Uh, sure, I can try. Yours, anything. Your, uh, anything. Uh, 
Great. Okay, so um, Elizabeth, uh, if uh, you can't uh, get, you, I, I guess I can just uh, do the bird sightings for this one meeting, given that you seem to be having some troubles uh, with your um, Zoom, but uh, you can uh, keep uh, any uh, records that we get. So yeah, sure. Uh, anyone who has some birds, uh, uh, do you want to start? Yes. Well, I had uh, two very nice sandhill cranes on Kellogg Road yesterday, just standing in the field with all the geese. And I think I let Elizabeth know, but unfortunately, as I went round the block and came down uh, Deer Park Road, I saw two beautiful uh, sandhill cranes flying off to the northwest. So I guess they didn't stay in the field terribly long. Um, so there's certainly a lot of movement going on. I had a fox sparrow in my backyard today. That was nice. But the red poles finally seemed I might to be as well You're breaking up, Elizabeth. We yeah. had a we had a red we had a red red breasted woodpecker. Breaking at our, up. At, at You're our, breaking off too. I'll the computer. Yeah, I think, woodpecker. Yeah, I think Elizabeth is just having trouble with her connection because I think she's only hearing part of what we're saying and we're only hearing mm -hmm. part of what she's saying. So. Yep. Anyway, carry on. Well, I don't want to hear any more about Margaret Sandhill Cranes because she phoned me and I got in my car and raced up the Kellogg Road with the pedal right to the metal and there were no bloody cranes there. And I came home and there was a message <laughs> on the telephone saying, don't bother going, there are no cranes. So. <laughs> However, um, um, uh, Margaret and I did get uh, one thing for uh, just kick off our uh, Atlas Square. Uh, a couple of days ago, I went out in my porch to the newspaper and there was wild cackling going on and there was a merlin making tight circles all around my house, finally flew up to the top of a tree and uh, bombed another merlin there and then did something that seemed to be most unseemly. And uh, Margaret and I think we have our first uh, indication of breeding uh, with a pair of Marlins uh, on College Street. So uh, that's the good news. The bad news was the cranes. <laughs> you do have exciting times, don't you? We try. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'll, it's Ken Bagshaw, I'll volunteer one. Um, uh, we were at the dog park in Coburg at about uh, <clears throat> one. 1.30, I guess it was this, this afternoon, quite quite a heavy wind blowing through there. And I looked up and there was a turkey vulture gracefully gliding over our heads there and heading northward, didn't stay around there very long. So I can't report more than he was present and looked pretty spectacular up in the air above us. That's nice. I, was, I was afraid Ken was gonna say there was breeding evidence of dogs in the dog park or something. <laughs> Um, I, Thank you, Richard. Very D tired. Diane Chin here. Um, <laughs> I have um, a, a Carolina wren in my backyard yesterday, making quite a lot of noise. This characteristic noise oh. up in the trees, and and then swooping down and feeding on my suet. So, not sure how many. Probably a couple at least. Oh. I saw that Jeanette Johnson was among the people here at present. Jeanette and I have been sharing a couple of Carolina wrens between our backyards, but I haven't seen uh, these ones for um, two or three weeks. So now you've got one. And I think um, Richard Gerardo has got another one on um, Darcy Street. Yes, I, I had uh, the uh, Carolina, a Car Carolina wren at Darcy and, and um, Chapel. And then I heard... Um, Carolina ran again at uh, Chapel and uh, uh, Walton Street uh, yesterday, uh, but only yeah. for very, very brief, very, just a uh, quick sing and then it was off again. Uh, but I did have uh, three uh, kill deer up at uh, Carmel Road on uh, Tuesday as well in the, in the field, uh, um, looking like they were into early uh, courtship uh, uh, at this point, so it was uh, that was kind of interesting to see. 
And uh, Rob Lonsbury uh, uh, called me today, and he has uh, the Carolina Wren that Jeanette and uh, uh, Margaret have, I think, been sharing, because he's in a triangle right from their houses. Uh, and uh, he's uh, got, the, it was there last year on his property uh, at the uh, University and William, and uh, it was there singing again yesterday and today. So uh, we've obviously got uh, more than one group of Carolina Wrens in Goldberg that are active. So if people could keep letting Margaret and I know uh, where they are and when they're hearing them, that would be great. Um, I, I live right near Margaret and um, uh, as well, and Jeanette. So it could be the same ones that are just going into checking out my suet on a regular basis. Yeah, I'm sure Diane's and Rob's are probably the same bird because you guys are quite close as the as the Carolina wren flies. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> a, few, a, few, a few days ago, we had uh, a loon flying from west to east along Lake Ontario. And oh my! There seems to be one that stays every year, and uh, I've got lots of. Uh, robins migrating through. Uh, quite something to see a flock, I don't know, 20 robins in, uh, in the field next to me. And as for crows, well, I can't beat anybody, but I've got uh, crows, uh, breeding evidence. I have crows gathering nesting material and they're in the tree practically in front of us. And we watch daily to see what they're doing and it's fun to watch them collecting next to nesting material. But uh, it's not very exciting, but it's still fun to do. Mm, that's nice. I wonder if uh, Katsu has seen any shorebirds lately down at the Coburg Harbor. I notice a lot less down there now. Oh, I haven't been there for the last couple of days, but I uh, I saw uh, two bird owl at uh, Corbett's, north of Corbett's Dam yesterday, and then uh, two uh, turkey vultures, and, and that's about it, yesterday. Oh, we saw... There was a, a horned grebe in the harbor today, and a horned grebe, and then a couple of days ago, there was a photograph of a redneck grebe in the harbor, um, on uh, eBird, so nice. things are on the move. Nice. Well, Tish and I saw a, uh, a turkey vulture today in Ontario Street North. Um, uh, so they're they're out and about, and I think they've been out and about for a bit yet, but I, I'm not sure yeah. of that. We had a red red uh, red bellied uh, woodpecker at our bird feeder today. Mm -hmm. Nice, which is which is nice. Yeah. Yeah. Does anyhow just a comment? Um, Frank, 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 you here. probably saw the same one I did because I the dog parks on Ontario Street, so I think we we had the both same one in view. Could very well be Ken. <laughs> okay, so I, one other thing before we go, um, there's been a a real flurry of butterflies lately. I hope, uh, I know other people have reported them and taken pictures of them. They, they show up on the, a couple of different sites I go on locally. Um, I saw a morning cloak yesterday and, and, and a number of other varieties of butterflies at, at the property north of Dale Road in Coburg. Had two mallards come in our pond today. It would be the first water birds that we've had. And that's because despite this really warm weather, our pond has stayed pretty well iced over until the last couple of days, so uh, which is unusual. Usually the pond tends to open up earlier and uh, we get geese and uh, sometimes the nesting mallards come in. So maybe these two will stay. Hmm, that's exciting. Does anyone else have any birds or are we good to move on? Good to move on. Good to move on, yeah. Okay, well, thank you very much, uh, Jamie, for that. And I'm sorry that Elizabeth couldn't get on. I know she really looks forward to this, and we all look forward to hearing from her as well. Um, so thank you. The next item of business, uh, Denny Manchi uh, of the Coburg Ecology Garden recently asked if the club would mention the 25th anniversary commemorative video of the Ecology Garden to our members. So therefore, we are very pleased to present the video tonight uh, Jamie, could you please play that YouTube video?
for us. <laughs> I know we saw this One last week. The big that? idea. That's how the Coburg Ecology Garden began third. 25 years ago. Her name was Minnie Pinnell, and she was unstoppable. Hello, everyone. I'm uh, Sister Linda Gregg from Villa St. Joseph Ecology and Spirituality Center. Minnie Pinnell was adamant that she was going to start an ecology garden and that she heard that I did workshops on organic gardening, so she wanted me to be part of it. Um, I'm Miriam Mouton and I'm a landscape architect. Um, Minnie Pinnell had invited me to help with the design of the original garden. And so right from day one, was involved with the garden and prepared a plan. The part of the garden has since evolved. Landscape architecture student Sarah Taylor also helped Minnie realize her dreams in the early years. That oak tree is probably like I see that. That was part of the original plan. And um, that really is kind of the root that ties it to the beginning. We um, planted that oak tree that's in the corner. So she was content with that for a year. And then she thought, we really need some more space here. And there's other plants that need to go in here. And there's, you know, we could have uh, some trees planted more than what we have here. And benches would be nice too. So she did uh, very well. Uh, well being able to convince people that it would be wonderful to donate this and how wonderful the ecology garden was going to be for the people of the town. She went to the uh, Legion Village board meeting almost every year and asked for another just 10 feet. And so, Every year, for about five years, we kept getting another 10 feet. <laughs> for many, it was incredibly important that there be a spiritual component to it. She wanted it to be interfaith. She wanted everybody to realize that part of our spirituality involves the earth we are a part of it and that resonated very much with my heart and work that I was doing here. Sunrise Earth Day ceremonies have become a tradition at the garden and they often attract a large following. It was a teaching garden, it was a teaching place and it was also a place where people could come and learn hands-on. Uh, uh, right from the start, it wasn't strictly for natural plants, but it was a very strong environmental component. It was um, to be able to demonstrate how to garden and garden in a sustainable way and in an ecologically um, sensitive and supportive way and, and to learn. So there really were no strict rules and of course no dangerous plants. <laughs> good about this garden it's arranged as a series of islands so to take what you learn from here take those lessons back home could be um, could even be a series of pots on a balcony could be a corner in a, in a front or backyard uh, could be even on a grander scale uh, on, on a larger pot
this garden shows that it becomes even better with time. It can have the traditional look and there's flower beds, there's memorial bits and pieces here and there, but it, it gets even better. <laughs> Coburg teacher James Quelch was chair of the garden from 2013 to 2015. He brought his passion for dry stone wall construction to the site and led the team of volunteers who built the limestone seating circle around the gazebo. The late Eric Winter was Coburg's first poet laureate. He wrote Poem to a Gardener in 2009, a tribute to Minnie Pinnell's tenacity and energy. His son has also contributed to the garden. Well, my name is Julian Winter. Um, I'm a soil scientist, yeah, and a plant ecologist. And uh, what is my connection to the garden? Well, my parents knew Minnie Pinnell uh, right at the beginning, and uh, and uh, she knew they knew Minnie Pinnell as she was starting out this garden and arguing with uh, Legion Village to to get a little little spot, and uh, and then watched it grow. These tree trunks uh, were, uh, came from an old um, Manitoba maple uh, that fell down at the east end of the town and they wondered what the town wondered what the heck are we going to do with the logs and, uh, uh, and we had a solution. Well the hoogel is a uh, buried log pile and uh, it's an old European technique of farming uh, to uh, to use the logs as a uh, as, as a base for absorbing water. The logs themselves don't have a, an awful lot of nutrients in them because they're mostly cellulose. But they, as they decompose, they will hold a lot of water, and they also uh, can support a lot of animal life in the interstices of the uh, of the logs and the uh, uh, voles eating the wood lice and things like that. as I was doing it I was thinking waves uh, no I, was, I thought that some people would interpret this as waves but I wasn't really designing waves I was just designing forms that could be seen as either being born uh, from out of a small bump in, 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 in the landscape and bigger and bigger or as disappearing uh, from bigger waves and disappearing into a small bump and so uh, really it, it, uh, it depended on your point of view Hi, I'm Dora Bodie. I'm the current chair of the Coburg Ecology Gardeners, the volunteer group that maintains and enhances the ecology garden. There are currently about 15 core volunteers, as well as several community partners. When I became Prez, the older section of the garden, um, the part that stretches from Hibernia Street to the arbor or the accessible tables, was in need of some tough love and some tender loving care because it had gotten a bit on the scraggly side and a bit overgrown. So one of the things I really wanted to do was to get that um, not cleaned up, but just sort of looking better. Give Mother Nature a bit of a hand instead of having her run rampant. Um, the other thing was at the time, when you were looking west from the Hoogle, the garden just sort of ended. And so one of my goals in life has been to evolve the West End of the Garden, which uh, seems to be happening quite nicely. A Manitoba maple trunk, eerily shaped like a snail or maybe even a rabbit, was rescued from a home on Ontario Street in May 2020. It became the first tree sculpture in the garden. White elm, Ohio buckeye, balsam fir, and crabapple trees 
have all been planted since 2019. They represent a pop-up forest in the making. The massive trunk of a 130-year-old green ash killed by emerald ash borers was moved to the West Garden in the fall of 2020, thanks to Rob Tinney and his crew from Wareham Tree Service. It's a reminder of the fragility of the forest in the face of invasive species. Um, there's something important to learn here almost every day, but definitely through every season of the year. Twenty-five years in the making, the Coburg Ecology Garden is a model of community engagement and stewardship of public lands. Long may it flourish. Thank you very much. I hope everyone enjoyed that. The, uh, the production was a little bumpy for us because of our connections, I guess. But uh, if you want to see a really clear ver version of that, you can, uh, if, if the Ecology Garden has a website, uh, the YouTube link is actually very good. And I saw that. And a lot of us actually walk by that place every day in Coburg. So I appreciate it very much. At this point in time, um, I'm going to ask Tim Tottenham to come forward uh, to please introduce tonight's guest speaker. So Tim. Where is Tim? Tim, you're muted. There we are. Can you hear me now? Yes. Thank you. Anyway, I'll try again. I would like to extend a very warm welcome to our speaker tonight, uh, Elaine Jameson. Elaine was born in Peterborough, so she's a, a neighbor of sorts and was encouraged to learn about nature and she immersed herself in the outdoors from a young age. She completed her undergraduate degree at Dalhousie University in Halifax, Nova Scotia, majoring in biology and English. She has had the opportunity to sever, to study, sorry, tree swallows, tree swallows, um, uh, where are we, uh, in the Annapolis Valley, and also conducted a herring, gull, and common eater uh, census on Kent Island in the Bay of Fundy. Her love of the field work led her to pursue a master's of science at Trent University in the environmental and life science program where she studied shore bird habitat use and foraging ecology on the Balls Island in South Carolina. Please welcome Elaine Jameson. And unmute, J Elaine, <laughs> you're, you're muted. There you are. Hi. Welcome, you. welcome, Elaine. Good to see you. Okay, uh, so I'll just um, pull up my screen here and uh, begin. So thank you very much, Willow Beach Field Naturalist, for having me. Uh, all right, you guys can see my screen, my PowerPoint here. Yeah, okay, wonderful. So my name is Ellen and I'm going to be sharing with you uh, some of my uh, research that I conducted while at Trent University. The title of my talk is A Day in the Life of a Shorebird in South Carolina. 
So you're all birders, as I heard. Um, so I'm sure you, you know what a shorebird is, but just a little uh, review, I guess. Shorebirds are a group of birds that live in wet coastal environments. They're commonly seen feeding along shorelines and in tidal mudflats. Shorebirds are a super important group of birds. They help with nutrient cycling by they eat invertebrate prey and then they deposit this waste, which goes back into the habitats they live in and helps to maintain a nice ecosystem balance. And our shorebirds are really great indicators of habitat health. So if shorebird populations are a little bit in flux, then there's likely other species out there or habitats that are being affected by some, some other component of the environment. So like I said, you, you're all naturalists. You, you probably know that shorebirds are in decline, major declines worldwide. Um, in North America, shorebird species have declined by 70% since the 1970s. Right now, there's five species listed by the Endangered Species Act, and there's over 25 species of concern. But the ultimate cause of these declines remains unclear. And one of the reasons is because studying shorebirds is really tricky because they migrate great distances. So shorebirds breed in the Arctic, and then they travel down through the Hudson's Bay, through James Bay, along the eastern Atlantic coast of North America to their wintering grounds in the southeast US. And some even go as far as South America. And from other studies that are being conducted at Trent University and at Ottawa and in the US, we've, we found out that adult survival on the breeding grounds is actually pretty high, considering that shorebird populations are declining. So these low, the low survival might be traced to the wintering grounds. So that is what brought me to Bulls Island in South Carolina. And this is a distance of about 7,000 kilometers that, that shorebirds migrate. And very few studies have been conducted in the Southeast in this region um, that document shorebird abundance in, during their non-breeding season, so in the winter. And here we go on down into Bulls Island. This 5,000 acre island that I lived on for about eight months. So what's happening down here on Bulls Island during the winter? Well, imagine you've just flown 7,000 kilometers. That's like 167 marathons. You might be a little bit hungry. And that's what happens here on the wintering ground. So it's just an all you can eat buffet. This is the main reason that shorebirds come and use these habitats. They congregate in large flocks and they eat and they eat, 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 eat. For a few, many different reasons. They need to refuel after this long migration from their breeding grounds. They need to maintain good body condition to survive the perhaps harsher winter weather that they might encounter down here. And they also need to maintain their, their body condition to return to the Arctic in order to have a successful breeding season the following year. So imagine you show up to your favorite southern restaurant for some grits and gumbo and some shrimp, and it's been replaced by a subdivision. It's been trampled by tourists or completely wiped out by a hurricane. So down south, these are the two biggest threats to shorebird populations, climate change, and human disturbance. So climate change, we all, we've all heard about it. It's having major effects on shorebird habitats on the wintering grounds. There's rapid erosion that's ca caused by rising sea levels and aggressive and more frequent storm systems. So think back to Hurricane Florence and Matthew in the past couple of years. These storms had devastating effects on shorebird habitats in the Southeast. So these, these storms that come in, they might affect the habitats and they might also affect where shorebirds come back to after, during, after they've bred and then return to their non-breeding grounds. So this is, um, this is part of my study site here on Bulls Island. And you can see just from me this, this graphic, I guess, or this illustration that the shoreline has actually reduced by about 900 meters since the 1800s. So drastic reduction in available habitat for shorebirds. And this is a rate of six to 7.5 meters per year. 
And I witnessed this in my two field seasons. Uh, so I was there in 2018 and 2019. And even within a year span, I noticed a, a decrease in the amount of shoreline that was available to shorebirds. So it's a, it's a drastic decline in available habitat. So like I said, human disturbance is also a huge impact on shorebird, uh, shorebird habitats. So there's a ton of development on Atlantic coasts. There's pollution. The number of times I stopped to pick up balloons like this on the beach or garbage that had washed up. There's ecotourism that's taking over beaches on the Southeast. And there's also increased human activity and development on beaches that are really important feeding habitat for shorebirds. So things like beach renourishment projects, maybe you've been down to a beach in Florida and it's this pristine white sand. That's probably been put there by beach renourishment projects that um, where sand is dredged up from offshore locations and deposited along this shoreline to reconstruct a beach that has been eroded by rising sea levels. But these types of projects can severely reduce the invertebrate prey availability and diversity on beaches. That's really important food for shorebirds. So this is, um, I just wanted to talk a little bit about the case of Crab Bank. So Crab Bank is sort of a similar type of habitat as Bulls Island, granted on a much smaller scale. So this is a sandbar that's located in the Charleston Harbor. And this was built by dredging spoils and it's constantly shifting in size and shape because of the erosion. You can see how narrow it is. And with the, the tide and, and the amount of movement of ships in this harbor, it's constantly changing shape and the amount of sand that's there. And this is one of South Carolina's most critical seabird and shorebird nesting colonies. 15 different species of birds including American oyster catchers, brown pelicans, black skimmers, and royal terns use this, use crab bank for a nesting site. And typically in a breeding season, there can be about 5,000 nests. But this island is also frequently visited by people with their dogs, which causes disturbance to nesting birds, lowers nesting success, and can really affect the, the populations of birds that are using this island. So in 2006, this was this island or this the sandbar, sorry, was designated a seabird sanctuary. So it was closed off to the public. People could no longer bring their dogs here. But today, this sandbar has eroded to the extent that no birds nested there in 2018. So versus 5,000 nests before 2006, and then in 2018, no, no nests at all. So in 2019, which was my second field season, there was the launch of a, the Save Crab Bank and Save the Pelicans project. So this project raised $100,000 to restore Crab Bank. And it, but this, so there's sort of conflicting opinions on this because yes, we wanna restore the habitat, but we're using sand that might mismatch what the birds need, okay? so. This issue of environmental impact of dredging and the mismatch of sediments, which can affect invertebrate communities that colonize the sand with potential downstream effects on food availability for shorebirds and other nesting birds. So there's sort of a lot going on here in terms of how, how to save the birds, how to help the birds, and also how to protect the, the integrity of the environment and of the whole system. So this is why I was on Bulls Island, essentially, because Bulls Island is an undisturbed, unaltered, heterogeneous habitat. So there's a ton of different habitats on the shoreline of Bulls. We've got intertidal sandy beach. We've got a mudflat. We've got maritime forests in the interior, and there's also some salt marsh. And Bulls Island is untouched, essentially, from human disturbance. There is an ecotourism company that, that comes the odd time, kind of every 
every other weekend with a group of people. And there is a house there that I stayed in. But in terms of renourishment projects, nothing has happened on bulls. So this is really key because it's a baseline from which we can understand what human disturbance and what beach renourishment projects could be doing in the future. Okay, so Bulls Island is a large island in the Cape Romaine Sandy Delta region. This is a site of international importance in the Western Hemisphere Shorebird Reserve Network, which some of you might have heard of. This means that it hosts tens of thousands of shorebirds annually, including approximately 29 different species. And a lot of these species are species of concern. Bulls is also part of the Cape Romaine National Wildlife Refuge, which is federally managed by US Fish and Wildlife, but it also falls into the jurisdiction of South Carolina Department of Natural Resources. It's in charge of kind of managing, monitoring, protecting conservation research throughout the state. So we've got federal and state here. And then there's also this ecotourist company, Coastal Expeditions, which has the ferry service to and from the island. So there's a lot of parties involved in kind of the management of this island. And then there was me, the little Canadian from Trent University here to count birds. So I was sort of negotiating with not only the field work, but sort of all these political parties and companies, organizations involved. And they did not like my pink rubber boots, I'll tell you that much. So with all these parties in, involved and the unknowns, we, we really needed to understand like what's happening here on the island? Who are the players? Who are the birds? What habitats are they using and why is it important? So I sort of went into my field season with a really, really general questions. Who is who in terms of the birds are using Bulls Island? Like what species? What are they doing on bulls? Where are they distributed on this 5,000 acre island? When are they using the island and why? And a thorough survey of shorebird numbers had not been done since 2004. So I came in 14 years later with kind of a blank slate in terms of what birds were, were going to be there. So to answer these questions, I had to get in the field. So kind of two, two objectives, objectives for this talk are to sort of talk a little bit about my research, but also to give you a little glimpse into life in the field and what, uh, what sometimes you have to deal with as a, as a field biologist and what kind of cool or uncomfortable situations I found myself in. Anyone who's done field work knows exactly what I mean. <laughs> okay, so one of the first, one, the biggest part of my research actually was doing surveys. So it's kind of hard to get um, group participation on Zoom, but how many of you have heard of the International Shorebird Survey? This, I don't know, show of hands or, or the Christmas bird count. I'm sure many of you have done the Christmas bird count before. Okay, so the International Shorebird Survey is kind of like the Christmas bird count. It's once, a, but it's once a month at a time and location when the bird count will be the most accurate. So it's sort of a snapshot of the diversity and abundance. But what I wanted to do was really take a deep dive into a day in the life of a shorebird in South Carolina. So I conducted standardized ground surveys of the beach. I had a three and a half kilometer um, survey area along the, the northeast end of the, the island. And I walked this every day, twice a day, from January to April in my two field seasons, so 2018 and 2019. And I did this in the morning and the afternoon, cold days, windy days, hot days, weekends, weekdays. And I counted birds. I counted so many birds. I recorded the species composition. So here we've got some black, black bellied plovers and some, some Dunlin here. This is towards the end of my field season. So you can sort of see them molting into their, their um, breeding plumage and some red knots as well. 
So in my two field seasons, I did 85 surveys and they were all very different, all very weird. How many eBirders are there <laughs> on this meeting? Lots of eBirders or, or life listers. Yeah. Of course, I'm gonna feel natural as medium. Of course, there's life listers. So just to give you a little idea of the numbers behind my surveys. On a single day, I had four, my, this is my peak count, my max count was 4,386 birds in a single day. This is just shorebirds, 21 different species. And in 2019, I counted 60,340 birds over the span of four months. And crunching all of these numbers, I got my who. So I got my top three species on bulls. So Dunlin, Sanderling, and semi-palmated plovers were the most abundant shorebird species. So here I'm just showing kind of the, the time, my surveys over time from January to April. So we see sort of peak counts in March and April as the birds from further south start to pass through and stop and, the, and on their way on their migration north. I saw a dip in February and March. It got really cold. There was actually um, some storm warnings. So I saw some, some lower numbers there. And then red knot I've also included here because many of you probably are familiar with the, the case of the red knot, this, this poor species that's really suffering. So I, I saw very low numbers of red knots in, in 2018. But what was, what was kind of interesting is I, for the, my top three species, I saw similar trends in 2019. But red knots, I saw a lot more in 2019, which was kind of interesting. And, I, and I'm not really sure why, but I have a little bit of a hypothesis. So red knots are federally endangered. Um, I don't know if many of you are familiar with like the, the James Bay Shorebird Project. Um, this is one of their big things um, up in James Bay. They're, they're looking for red knots and they're looking for flagged red knots to estimate the population. So I've been up to James Bay a couple of times looking for red knot flags. And this, because this species is really, really declined severely. Right now, the, the current estimate of the Rufa subspecies is only 42,000 individuals, which is quite low. And these birds are amazing. They winter as far south as Tierra del Fuego, which is in Chile, uh, at the southernmost tip of South America. And they pass through Delaware Bay during spring migration to feed on horseshoe crab eggs. And they sort of, they time this migration with the, the major spawning events. So horseshoe crab, these are, these are horseshoe crabs, kind of interesting looking animals, um, some of them are quite big, but bigger than a dinner plate even. And I, I saw some of these on, on bulls, which was really great. But horseshoe crabs are harvested. And this is a major problem for the red knot population and it's only getting worse. So horseshoe crabs are harvested all along the Atlantic coast of the US. And they're harvested because they have this blue blood that's used in the biomedical industry. For, used for detect, detecting bacteria in blood. So it's basically an antibiotic test, testing agent. I don't really un, understand all the biomedical details of it. I'm a birder, not a, <laughs> not a doctor. Um, but essentially they're used to test for medical testing. One quart of horseshoe crab blood, it costs about $15,000. So they're very, very valuable. After these crabs have been bled, they're released, but the rate of survival is not monitored at all. And their population is really suffering. And guess what? COVID is affecting horseshoe crabs as well, because today this is an even bigger problem for shorebirds. Horseshoe crab blood is essential to making COVID vaccines. So we have an increase in COVID vaccine need 
therefore we need, need more horseshoe crab blood. More horseshoe crabs are being harvested, less eggs for red knots to feed on. So this population of shorebirds that's already suffering could be even more affected. So this is beyond my current or my master's research, but really significant problem for shorebird populations in, in kind of upcoming, in the near future. So not really sure what's gonna happen with these red knots. When I first was down in, in on bulls, I sort of hypothesized that may, maybe Delaware Bay, where they get the horseshoe crab eggs, is becoming a less reliable stopover location. And that's why we're seeing more red knots further south on Bulls Island. But that's for the next master's student to, to look into. So we clearly see that there's a link between food availability, behavior, and population trends. So this is why I investigated food availability on Bulls Island as well. So here is my little GoPro footage of my invertebrate sampling. So I took soil samples in all different habitats on the island and I, I sieved through the soil samples in right there on the coast and I counted invertebrates. So I wanted to know how prey availability was affecting shorebird distribution on the island and what, what habitats they were using. So all day long, freezing pans in the ocean, but this was actually one of my favorite parts of my field work. It was kind of um, meditative and, and cool. I, I surprisingly liked it more than I thought I would. <laughs> Okay, so the, here's a, a, some more close up. So this is in the, the marsh relic habitat, which I'll, I'll talk to a, a little bit more. And I was mostly finding polychaete worms in, in this mud. So to find out which variables were predicting where shorebirds were feeding, I used a modeling approach. So I got really into the stats. Um, I ran something called a negative binomial reg regression. So I used um, all these different habitat variables and sort of ran my, my shorebird counts in this model to see which variables most affected my counts. So I looked at spatial variables, including habitat, um, area, and tide. I looked at temporal variables, mostly just month, looking at seasonal differences in shorebird um, numbers and habitat use. And finally, this, this food availability piece. So firstly, area. I just, oh, the sound is on on this video. I wasn't expecting that. But I guess you can hear the birds. So this is uh, mostly Sanderling and Dunlin here. And they're, they, feed, they really spread out on these wide areas of beach and they love to feed on the, the intertidal and the mudflats where this maximum feeding habitat is exposed. And they sort of peck along in the swash zone, they follow the tide in and out. You, you might've seen this before. So looking at habitat, I found, this is sort of the, the distribution of the different habitats in my study site. And Bulls Island is, a, is what I would like to call a habitat mosaic. It's an unaltered heterogeneous beach. So I've got all these different habitats that haven't been changed other than through natural circumstances like erosion. And this is really key because this is the baseline data that is showing sort of what a natural unaltered beach, heterogeneous beach looks like. So I, I found that the different species use different habitats. So there's not like a one size fits all answer in terms of management practices. So there's a diversity of species because there's a diversity of habitats on this island. So like I said, this, this marsh relict was a really popular feeding habitat for shorebirds. And this marsh relict is a super interesting phenomenon on Bulls Island, as well as on other barrier islands in the region. So this habitat is essentially a 500 year old salt marsh that was originally closer to the interior of the island 
but with erosion and winds, the, this island has sort of shifted where the sand was distributed. So the intertidal is now the salt marsh. And it's sort of on the, the exterior of the island and it's like this, this hard kind of clay dense sediment that, the, that lots of bivalves burrow in, so little donax um, clams the shorebirds just go to town on. So this is sort of an interesting phenomenon that's happening that could be um, sort of an alternate feeding habitat for shorebirds that has um, appeared due to like ephemeral natural processes. So I also found of course that the habitat availability is affected by the semi-diurnal tidal cycle. So in a day, there's two high tides and two low tides. So as the tide comes in, so here I'm showing the tide height increasing. So as the tide rises, we see the birds congregating in large flocks to roost, to rest. This happens overnight typically, but it also happens during the daytime high tide. As the tide starts to fall, the invertebrates that were under the surface of the water start to come up for air. So this prey is now a little bit more available. And this is when I see the, the birds coming out from their, their high tide roost and start to feed in the intertidal zone. So this like freshly revealed feast. So I sort of found number of, shorty, number of feeding shorebirds peak at these falling tides. So the tide predicts where and when the shorebirds are going to go and Field work, of course, I found out that the same could be said for us. So this is my little Boston whaler that I, I used to get in and out of the mainland. And I got caught on the shore one day when the tide went out and I didn't, uh, I was trapping birds and we didn't realize that the tide had gone out and we were caught high and dry. Luckily we had another boat anchored off um, in, in the water so we could still wade out to the, the boat and, and then come back later at the, when the tide came back in to get this boat. But just um, one, of those, one of those days, right? Where everything <laughs> goes wrong, but a, and just a learning experience nonetheless. So fi my final sort of piece of my modeling was invertebrate abundance. So I found that invertebrate prey was strongly associated with habitat type. So this means that prey availability is an indicator of habitat quality, but this might be different depending on the shorebird species because different shorebirds have different diets. So for example, in the mudflat, I found mostly these polychaete worms. And I also mostly saw the semi-palmated plovers, the little sepal feeding in the mudflat. So from this, I can determine perhaps that the diet of the semi-palmated plovers is mostly polychaete worms. So even though I didn't look specifically at diet, based on my behavioral observations and my invertebrate sampling, you can sort of figure out what birds are eating what and when. And then in the intertidal sandy beach, I mostly found these little amphipods that are like little, little crustacean. Um, and this is where I mostly saw Dunlin and Sanderling feed. So different habitat usage, depending on which food was available. So the third sort of piece of my, my research, so I had the surveys, I had the invertebrate sampling, and the third piece was doing focal observations. So this is, my, this is me and my, my trusty field assistant, Sydney, who is a uh, lives in South Carolina still, but great field tech. Um, so we we did these behavioral observations. So looking through a scope, one of us would would um, you know count the the pecks of the birds and kind of say peck 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 every time a bird was pecking, and the other person would record. And I I tallied all these behavioral observations to look at pecking rates activity time budgets and also sometimes we could see when they had a successful prey capture so it was like peck 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 worm peck 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 worm and then I transcribed all of this data and was able to to look at foraging strategies in different species 
So my study investigated the qualities of this pristine habitat on shorebird distribution, abundance, and behavior. This baseline information might assist in identifying any stressors to shorebird populations that might result in the future due to a degraded habitat. So if these habitats that are exposed primarily at low tide disappear, so from erosion, from beach renourishment projects, if, if shorebirds no longer have access to these beach habitats or beach habitats become more homogeneous, so less diverse habitats, then shorebird diversity is at a great risk. The main finding of my study is Bowles Island can support this number, a great number of shorebird species and a great number of shorebirds in general because it has these different habitats. So as unengineered beaches, beaches that are unaltered become really rare in the Southeast. My study is really critical in demonstrating that undisturbed heterogeneous beaches are really valuable to supporting the shorebird diversity. And that's kind of the, the main point of, of my research here. So I wanted to show you a little bit um, more, some others like little study adjacent things that I was able to do while, while in the field. Um, so we also looked for shorebird flags. So little, little colored leg bands and flags with alphanumeric codes. So this was a kind of um, like a where's Waldo situation in the field. So here we have a, a semi-palmated plover and it has a green leg, fla green leg flag, um, which means that it was banded in South Carolina. So each color is a different state. This is a South Carolina, Canada is white. Canada just has one color. Um, and then it also has a, a, you can see a silver leg band, and then you can kind of see that it has a little antenna sticking out the back, just under its tail. So this is the nano tag. So this is actually a bird that we banded while in the field and put a nano tag on. This is um, a black bellied plover that has, was banded in Canada, which is kind of cool because it has that white flag. So I was able to recite this and then add it to the, to the database that tracks where bird migration, which is another kind of cool, cool thing we did down there. So like I said, we nanotag birds. So I'm just gonna show you a little bit about um, how we trapped and banded birds. So we use cannon nets. Um, so I don't know if any of you have had the pleasure of volunteering or participating in a, in a cannon netting expedition. It's quite the ordeal. So just have a, little, a few video clips um, to show you. So, and this is um, folks from Virginia Tech who have quite an extensive piping plover study came down to, to help me set this up. So here's this video. I'm um, filling the cannon with, with gunpowder here. Oh, I'll just play this. So the net is sort of buried in the sand here and we have three cannons that we, we fill up with gunpowder and then we cover the net with rack. And this is one of my mentors. And then we have sort of a trip wire that will um, shoot the cannon off. I don't have a great video of the cannon, unfortunate, going off. <laughs> so there's us setting up the, the net. And then, like I said, I don't have a good video of the cannon going, the, going up, but it basically shoots this big net up and over a flock of roosting birds. So we've caught some, we caught mostly semi palmated plovers. And none of them are, are really, none of them are hurt during this process. It's a very light net, but we just reach under and pull them out. And we caught about 14 birds this, this time. So we get them out, we process them. So we measure their tarsus, we measure their bill length, we weigh them, we stick a flag on them and we stick a metal band on them. 
And then we also stick the nano tags on. So we, we use this super glue. We, we kind of cut some feathers off their back so that we can adhere this, this little nano tag. The nano tags will be picked up by towers all along this network up the southeast and all the way to the Arctic. So there's a few towers in James Bay. So this is our sort of processing team um, sticking this nano tag on. And it's just glued onto feathers. So once they've molted their feathers, then they'll lose the tag. And then we let them go. Free. So with this nano tag data, I was able to track some of the, the birds, their migration north. So what I found was these semi-palmated plovers actually take two different routes to go to their breeding grounds. Some of them go up the Atlantic coast and some of them go through the Great Lakes. Why they take these two different routes, we don't really know yet, but again, something for a future master's student to pursue. So are, are there any questions at this point? I feel like I've been talking a lot, but that's, that's Zoom for you. If any questions, you can put it in the chat or. Any questions from anybody? Jamie, can you put a chat out to everybody that will see it and ask them if they have any questions? Oh, can't hear me. So I don't know what, um, what the Willow Beach Field Naturalist does, but at the Peterborough Field Naturalist, they they start every, oh, I just stopped sharing. Um, they start every meeting with a quiz. So, and it's typically themed, like it'll be sparrows and they flip through the, the photos and there's prizes for people who get the right species. And sometimes it'll be wildflowers, whatever. So when I, I did this talk at the Peterborough Field Naturalists about a year and a half ago now, I guess. And I sort of turned the tables on them and, ha and had a quiz for them. So I don't, it might be harder to do through Zoom, but I've, I have some photos from my, my field work and um, sort of pull them up and, and maybe you can guess the species as we, as we go. I don't know if you wanna unmute or put it in the chat. So I'll just pull up my screen again and we'll do a little quiz. Okay. Oh, wait, I'm at the beginning now. Ellen? Yeah. Yeah, I'd rather, I'd, it's easier for me to ask in chat, put it in chat. Um, I'm just wondering, were you in any of these serious weather that we hear about going up the East Coast, you know, the la in the, these last few, few winters with these really uh, tornado or winter storms? Good question. I, during my field season, it wasn't hurricane season, luckily. Um, I had a couple close like scares, I guess, um, that there was sort of a, a big warning, like storm, storm surge coming in, don't leave your house. But I, I never was in any like terrible danger. We had very strong winds, 60 mile per hour winds a few times, um, and some pretty like heavy thunderstorms, but um, no, no major, no major uh, aggressive storms during my field season, which was really, really lucky. Yeah. My first year, actually, um, there was snow when I first got there, which was <laughs> like pretty unheard of. There was a state of emergency in South Carolina for three inches of snow, <laughs> which was really funny. Um, yeah. Um, so if anyone has some questions, uh, you can just turn on your, uh, your mics because uh, we can't actually hear any of you right now. Just keep that in mind. And I actually have one question myself. Uh, how, many, how many hours do you have to work a day on this project? <clears throat> so um, I was usually up around 3 a.m. <laughs> to do um, data input, like kind of working on the thesis component. 
And then I would head into the field around 5.30 a.m. and kind of be out in the field until sort of mid-afternoon. So it wasn't like crazy, like probably 3 p.m. I would sort of finish my field day and then, you know, data input and analysis in the evening as well. So it was early mornings, but I was, um, was done fairly early in the afternoons, I guess. But yeah, and, and so it was every day for four months for two years. Like I didn't take weekends off or anything. And I have a question for, for Ellen. Yeah. Um, can you hear me, Ellen? Um, yeah, um, I'm just wondering, do you live back in this part of the province now in, in Ontario? And um, are you interested in the shorebirds that we might see in Northumberland County, either on Rice Lake or the lakes north of it or along the Lake Ontario shoreline? Uh, and are you continuing your studies? <laughs> okay, well, so I actually, I'm in Toronto right now. I just finished Teachers College like this week <laughs> at Boise. Um, so I'm, I'm a high school teacher now. Um, so I'm hoping, I'm actually moving to Nova Scotia in about three weeks. So I'm going back out east and hopefully we'll be working out there. Right. Yeah, I'm not pursuing that academia. I liked the field work, but I didn't love the, it was isolating to be on, to be crunching numbers and doing stats all day. So, <laughs> yeah. I have a question. Uh, you, I believe, said you had uh, 29 species of shorebirds. I wondered if you could tell us what were the three or four of the most unusual shorebirds, say numbers 25 to 29, the ones that you weren't expecting that were rare. What did you find? Well, I can, I can show you actually. Um, okay, so... No egret, yeah, but what else? Oh, here we okay. still. So a ah. stilt. I only had about four uh -huh. in one of my field seasons. Really cool birds, and they only showed up towards the end of April usually, so kind of a migratory situation. Hmm. Um, the black neck stilts. Killdeer weren't um, on the beach as often, so I didn't see them because they were sort of more inland, but they were quite common on the island. I'm trying to think what else. Wimbrel. Yeah. So Wimbrel, I only had about four in a field season. They were a little bit more rare. And um, piping plovers were, I saw them quite often, but I only had about five on the entire island. So it was like the same five that were, that were showing up. Hmm. And um, Wilson's plovers. Oh. So I had, um, I think one year I had about 13 nesting pairs, which was pretty great because Wilson's plovers are, mm. I'm not sure if they're federally endangered, but they're endangered in the state in South Carolina. Mm. Um, and they breed on bulls. So they weren't um, overwintering there, but it was cool to see their pairs. And they sort of, um, if you ever have, have the opportunity to see a Wilson's plover, they're so cool. They sort of sneak around um they're just really neat we get one every 50 years at rescue <laughs> yeah <laughs> Ellen, i'm just wondering if there's any other species of organisms that you might have seen on the island that were kind of interesting i'm glad you asked <laughs> so let's see here i have well i mean in terms of birds some of the coolest um Gull build turns were amazing to see. Um, they just were beautiful. So ro royal turns had tons royal. of royal turns. So they were like I said, uh, alligators. <laughs> oh. Yeah. So there was a there's about 500 alligators on Bulls Island, which is when I first heard that I was blowing out of the water because I thought it's. 5,000 acres and there's 500 alligators, but I saw them, they were in, um, in hibernation, but for alligators, it's called brumation and they're out and about, but they don't metabolize. So they're not really a threat. Um, so I would walk by them on the regular, 
you could walk within a meter of them and they would just look at you. So lots of alligators. This is a couple of adults and um, I've got a great picture of some babies. This was a, a group of fr fresh gators that I happened upon. Yeah, I'm trying to think. Um, on the, I, I don't have any photos, but there was um, a pair of coyotes that I saw quite frequently. And on bulls, the coyotes were black, like really dark black. And I would see them at early in the mornings. And um, one of the one of the, the trappers that was hired by the, the state government to come over and trap mostly raccoons and coyotes because they were such a threat to the turtles and the shorebirds. He would say, what, you saw them again? I'm trying to trap them. And I would see them when I'm out early in the morning. And he said, I'm gonna give you my gun so you can get them tomorrow. <laughs> I never did, but so coyotes, raccoons, <laughs> deer. Any interesting snakes? Oh yes, <laughs> I almost almost stepped on a cotton mouth. Oh, one day. This is a this is a cotton mouth. I had um, uh, black rat snakes, uh, diamondbacks. Yeah. Um, yeah. So they 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 weren't really out until sort of end of March, early April when this, and it got warmer. So I sort of had to be a little bit more wary about where I was walking. Um, but yeah, I actually ran over a snake one day, which was unfortunate. What, you stepped on it? I, I came really, really close. I was out uh, walking and it was like this snake right here was in the leaf litter. And I didn't see it and I stepped down and I heard and I saw it come up like this and I had to take a photo of it and then run away. But, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but yeah. Um, yeah, my only injury in all my field seasons was I got stung by um, um, something called a mud wasp that blew up my foot. Like I, I stepped on it and I <laughs> blew up my foot like insane. Um, but that was my only injury in my eight months there. So not bad. Just had some Benadryl, so it was all, all good. <laughs> Any interesting turtles? Um, not like a ton of turtles, to be honest. Um, I'm trying to think of, yeah, I don't know. Yeah, I didn't see them very often. I think because they were hibernating. Think of this is a juvenile black crowned night heron. Yeah. Hey, Ali, was there a lynx on the island too? Bobcat. Yeah, Bobcat. <laughs> yeah. Tell us the story about when you were running and how you went back later and the Bobcat tracks was on top of your shoes. Oh, yeah, yeah. I was. The, the animals were tracking me as much as I was tracking them, for sure. <laughs> yeah, but um, I guess. The cat can stop. Yeah. Are there any other questions? There's a green heron there. Yep, there's a green heron. Yeah, the, the herons were amazing. Tricolored. It was really cool to see them kind of come into their breeding plumage and get their, their plumes on top. Anyway, any other questions from anybody before we say goodbye? Ellen, thank you very, very much. That was fascinating. I loved it. And I'm sure everybody else did as well. Anyway, thank you very, very much. And I really appreciate you taking the time to come and talk to us. Well done. Frank, over to you. Thank you, Tim. And thank you, Ellen. That was very delightful. Um, so this brings us to the end of our meeting. Um, please mark your calendars for the next general meeting on Friday, uh, April 30th, 
2021 to start at 7.30. You can uh, book in at 7, uh, as most of you did tonight, I think. And the topic is Canadian Migration Monitoring Network. It sort of ties in, I guess, with some of the stuff that you've been doing, Ellen. Um, and the presenter is Brian Cook. So with no more business on the agenda, I will say good night to everyone. Good night. Good night. Thanks, Frank. Thank you. Good night. Good night, everybody. Uh, yeah. Good night. Good night. Good night. Nice. And thank you very much. No, Good night, all. Jamie, are you still there? Yes, I am. Oh, I need to stop the recording. <laughs>